Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am so thrilled to see this crowd tonight. My name is Gwen McFarland, and I'm one of your elected officials. I'm one of your trustees. And on thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of my fellow trustees and fiscal officer Joe Hunterlaw, Mark Burning, and Dan Burning, we welcome you tonight. This is a great event. This, the music is going to be fabulous. And I also want you to thank Arts Connect for the great job that they have done to make this evening possible. So please, give Arts Connect a hand. And again, enjoy the music. And I'd like to turn it over to Kim Flam right now. She is, like, she, everything she touches turns out beautifully. So I'm going to turn the... <laughs> turn it over to Kim. <laughs> All right, good evening, Springfield Township. Thank you guys all so much for coming out to, this is our final summer concert series for 2015. And it has been a awesome, awesome experience bringing concerts back to the community. I don't know if you, don't, if you know this or not, but Springfield Township hasn't seen a full summer concert series since 2007. So with the help of some tremendous volunteers, our wonderful board, some support from uh, sponsorships and from grants, we were able to do uh, a full on summer concert series this year. It was extremely exciting. I'd like to introduce a couple of people that actually helped make this possible. And yes, I am actually gonna pull them up. They don't like to come up to the front, but um, I think that tonight, being this, that this is our final concert of the summer, this is a, a time for recognition for them. First of all, I'd like to introduce um, Maria Ballinger. She is a board member for Arts Connect. Where is he at? Tom Schneider, which is back there at the bar. He works, he works here at Springfield Township with uh, many, many roles, including renting out the Grove facility and the Senior Center. He's also on the board of the uh, of Arts Connect and uh, works tireless, tirelessly uh, to get the job done. Um, also, I'd really love to uh, recognize Karen Amond. Come on up. Yeah. I don't think Marva is here yet, but Marva Johns has been a very, very instrumental in this uh, process. Uh, Dan Dyche, he's here in the back. Come on up. And Mike Morgan, come on up. See, I told you they don't want to go back up here. Come on up, guys. Come on. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not starting without you guys. Now give them a round of applause. <laughs> they met in monthly meetings. They helped us with the soundboard. They helped get uh, sponsorships and they helped get donations for our silent auctions and they worked their tail off <laughs> uh, to bring you guys such a great, great series this summer. And we are very, very thankful. I'd like to thank all of our volunteers um, who are helping us, Linda in the back and way across. Uh, community media. You guys are actually live on TV. Woo! There's a full uh, schedule for our playback back there on the table. Uh, not only does Arts Connect bring you a concert series, we prevent we prevent <laughs> we present a family entertainment series, an educational series, and a dinner theater series. We've got some really cool upcoming programs, and I'd like to just share a couple of those with you really quick. Um, we've got postcards in the back that talks about our upcoming dinner series. We've got one coming up on August the 21st. We've got a guy coming in from America's Got Talent. We're doing this one for the first time ever as a family dinner theater. So kids are allowed to come to this. We brought the price of the, of the admission down. We're bringing the, the, uh, the dinner. is not the, the, the real high-end dinner that we normally have. It's just a plain old spaghetti dinner. Um, but uh, he's an illusionist. He actually lives here in Ohio. He's fantastic. And that event is going to be on August the 21st. 
Then this is the, and then the final one that we have, uh, we're bringing in a, a company called New Edge Cliff Players. I don't know if you've seen them or not, but they're absolutely fantastic. They are doing a radio show presentation of Strangers on the Train. So that's an, Al an Alfred Hitchcock mystery, uh, very intense. But they're doing it as if it was the 1930s on an old-fashioned radio show. So many characters play, or uh, one individual may play very different characters, and uh, they use uh, live props and also uh, sound effects from uh, Mike Martini. So it's a really, really great show. Um, another event that we've got coming up, if you're familiar with the Rusty Griswolds, they are an awesome band here in Cincinnati, and they are doing the Rusty Ball, and that's a huge event that they have down at the Duke Energy Center. You can buy tickets through Arts Connect at $20 off, and a portion of those proceeds actually support Arts Connect and the awesome program that we are doing. So we've got information in the back about that. Tonight's lineup will be an exciting one with the Cincinnati Civic Orchestra. Remember, we've got uh, pop and beer and wine and snacks uh, all back there. Feel free to go ahead and uh, fill your plates, fill your cups uh, throughout the evening. We will have a, uh, an intermission. Uh, and the, uh, dinner, or the desserts tonight were donated by DeStacy's and Vonderhaar's, and that serves as Arts Connect's full, uh, sole fundraiser tonight. So your support um, and making a donation uh, with the desserts helps, uh, helps us bring more community concerts. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event, ArtsWave, U.S. Bank, and Energy Alliances. And I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce to you to Cincinnati's only volunteer orchestra who will perform the theme as American as Apple Pie, the greatest works of our greatest composers, Larry Baumhaus and the Cincinnati Civic Orchestra. Please rise for our national anthem.
This is the last of our series of Summer Pops concerts. We've celebrated this entire summer the very greatest of American music. And it seemed appropriate to start with this amazing piece by Carl Grossman called The American Fantasy. Grossman was from an immigrant family, a family that knew and treasured the freedoms and potentials of our great country. And although he was European trained, his music has a distinctly American character. It shows his pride, it shows his accomplishment, and most important, I think it leads us off tonight to show the utter joy that our composers have writing great music in this country. Our music is like no other in the world. There's a freedom to it, and there's a joy to it that you just don't hear elsewhere. We give you the American fantasy.
greatest music by our greatest composers, the concert has to include Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein. Rodgers and Hammerstein single-handedly put Broadway on the map. Before them, the rest of the world knew that we had something going here we called Broadway. They didn't really quite know what to make of it. But after Rodgers and Hammerstein, there were Broadway-type theaters opened up in London, in Paris, even in Sydney, Australia. They opened the door to a truly new genre of music. And the most American of all their musicals is without any doubt, Oklahoma. It seems like the times they were writing in gave them more topics that came from the rest of the world than from our own country. They wrote about the King of Siam. They wrote about the South Pacific. Of course, in The Sound of Music, they tackled the courage and absolute horror of the people that lived through and rose to the occasion to fight back in the Second World War and do what was right. But in Oklahoma, they found more than any other piece of music the spirit of America, the spirit of expanding out across the plains, and also the spirit of everybody getting along together even though they had nothing in common. The wonderful song, The Cowboy and the Farmer Shall Be Friends. Think about that when they wrote it. They still were squabbling out there over where those cows were and where those steers were, and you really want a field where we could be grazing. But they, they brought it all together. They brought it all together in a unique way that only Broadway could give us. And this is a wonderful, wonderful capturing of that spirit and that music. We give you Oklahoma.
probably of America's most interesting composers. We have Leonard Bernstein's close friend and contemporary, and, and as he, as both of them would have said, partner in crime, Aaron Copeland. Copeland wrote a lot of music for the short movies that came out during the Depression. He wrote a lot of interesting music that just plain captured the spirit of the, of the great Western Plains and, and the folks that were out there. He also, though, had a lifelong fascination with Americans and with the faith that Americans had. Copeland grew up poor in New York City, and his parents, not really having the money to take care of him, sent him to a great uncle in the panhandle of Texas who ran a dry goods business. His uncle had been advertising that he had the only full-blooded Indian that ran a cash register in the world. And in fact, he had an Indian chief with a headdress at the cash register. But when Aaron arrived, he decided to run another ad. He had the only Jew in Texas. <laughs> and people would come in and say, where is he? Oh, you don't see anybody that looks different. And Aaron would hold his hand and say, it's, it's me. It's me. He learned a lot of lessons as a young man that sometimes being a little different made you special. And from the huge hodgepodge of people tossed together out there in West Texas, he learned that they all had the faith to get by in a really difficult world of sagebrush and unbelievable heat, of rain when you had it that would wash your house away, and faith in your neighbors, and believing together that something was greater. As he came back, he stayed with and learned about the Shakers. He actually stayed right down in Kentucky, south of us, at Shaker Village. And he found of all the ways Americans found their faith, that the Shakers were to him the purest example of what America meant. They never married, they took in orphans. And for 200 years, they kept their faith going, taking in the, the people no one else wanted, frankly. They never married and made children, but they sold the greatest seeds to farmers that you could get anywhere. Their seeds built the American farm. And most important, they lived a quiet life of faith. And when he took their famous Shaker melody, and set it down for the great Appalachian Spring Suite, he took just the melody and excerpted it out and said, this should be heard <coughs> by America. This shows us the way to our faith. He tied two strings to it. One, that when performed, his relatives, his family, his heirs would never charge any kind of royalties that any community-based orchestra any college orchestra could play it for free. But he asked one thing, that always before playing it, that the conductor would pick up the score and read the words to the melody. I will do that now. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come round where we ought to be. <coughs> and when we find ourselves in the place that's just right, t'will be in the valley of love and of delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. For to turn, to turn will be our delight till by turning and turning, we come round right. The Shaker Melody.
We're going to end the first half with a remarkable piece of music, the Broadway musical Ragtime. The music was written by a local composer, Stephen Flaherty, delightful, delightful human being that just loves to research periods of American history we don't know much about. And he looked back and he looked at that part of American music that is sort of just before Edison and his phonograph really let this know how things were played and how things happened. The little crank machine, watching the little films sort of go by, the Nickelodeon music, the music from some of the early silent films that actually had live orchestras or piano players playing in the playing in the pit. A time that America was coming of age. Those two decades when the immigrants arrived and everybody else had to figure out what to do with them, when the ramifications of being a free nation after the Civil War finally set in, and most important, I think, when the rest of the world realized if they were going to have their first world war, we were going to make the difference. We were a real country. We were a country to be reckoned with. This is music about how we grew up. It's not the Roaring Twenties. It's certainly not the patriotism of the Civil War. It's those decades that happened in between when we really found out who America was. And this music captures that spirit so beautifully. I found out just before the concert today that the author, the librettist of the musical passed away, which is really sad that we've lost one of the people that would have the courage to write a musical that going into it, everybody knew was going to lose money. This is one of those musicals that requires three orchestras, the one in the pit, the sort of jazz orchestra on the stage, and a full klezmer band representing the immigrants. There are over 20 speaking parts, everyone from Frederick Douglass to our early presidents, that don't sing a note. There's a chorus of immigrants. There's a chorus of Americans that are trying to figure out who these immigrants are. And then there's a rather amused chorus of African Americans saying, God, can't they figure one else out? We figured it out. <laughs> it's one of those musicals about a time in our history that we have conveniently forgotten. But one of the few times when we were truly together because we had no choice but to be together, and our music showed it. Now, after we play Ragtime for you, we'll take about a 10-minute break. The really nice volunteers here have all different sorts of good stuff to cool you down and fill you up. Uh, I will make the obligatory announcement. That's the ladies' restroom. That's the gentlemen's restroom. For those that are young and have never seen the two little symbols on the lights, uh, they, uh, the gentleman has pants on and the lady, well, I'm not quite sure what that thing is. It looks like it's out of a, I'm not sure. It's just, uh, it's a piece of history. So make sure you go to the right side. Uh, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. We have to ask you for two big favors. One, be careful of the wires that, uh, that are feeding the cameras that are taking and bringing this live to the community. And also be careful not to trip over any musical instruments or musicians. Uh, the musicians tend to wander aimlessly when they aren't playing, so you know, <laughs> don't worry about that. We give you ragtime. <laughs>
there was a time in America when there were no Broadway musicals. There was a time in America when all we had was called vaudeville. There is nobody left here that's old enough to remember that time. But when I was first conducting, there were still a few people that lived through the vaudeville era, and one dear, dear white-haired lady said, it was so awful. <laughs> I said, well, what was it like? And she said, bad singers singing songs that didn't follow logically one to the other, bad jokes, and then she smiled and she said, and to play in the orchestra, you had to be out of tune. <laughs> well, maybe it's a blessing that we don't have a lot of recordings of vaudeville, but we do have Showboat, which most of us consider to be the first Broadway musical. Now, when Jerome Kern premiered Showboat, he did not call it a Broadway musical. It happened to be the theater it performed in was on Broadway. And it happened to be the shows like it that had a theme and that worked as a true piece of theater were also performed on Broadway. And pretty soon people were asking for more of those musicals from Broadway, and they became known as Broadway musicals. The original score of Jerome Kern's Showboat is titled An American Opera, Showboat. I don't think he had any idea that he was starting an entirely new type of music that the whole world would come not only to love, but to say, boy, we're glad the old Italian operas are past us. The Americans have figured out how to do it. There's one other neat thing about Kern's musical Showboat. If you look in your program, you'll see the name of his librettist. At the time, a 19-year-old young fellow that was going to make his fame many years later as part of Rodgers and Hammerstein. You know, it's interesting how the old guys would work with the young guys. Because later in the concert, we're going to be playing West Side Story, and the name standing proudly with Maestro Bernstein's name is Stephen Sondheim, who at that time was only 20. Sometimes it takes the energy of that next generation to make real things happen. And I guarantee you that would have never happened any place but in America. We give you showboat. Picture the stage on the first night. You're in the audience not quite knowing what this is going to be. And after the introduction, this huge showboat, two stories tall, is pushed out onto the stage with electrical lighting and the whole cast on it singing something no one had ever seen before. Go back, think about that joyous occasion that only could have happened on Broadway in America. We give you Showboat.
one of the audience members who I've known for many years sort of captured me during break when I was trying to towel off enough of the water that I wouldn't be drenching the folks up front here, and said, you sure you don't have a bunch of ringers up there? It just sounds so good. <laughs> I cannot tell you anything other than these are all volunteers. No one up here is paid for this. This is given to you as a gift out of the love of music and, and just the joy of giving you this wonderful concert. Now, I will tell you that each time we've played this concert over the summer, it sounded a little better. The last time we played it, we were being rained on in the amphitheater at Coleraine. That didn't work so good. <laughs> at, at one point, I thought I heard a, an amazing hit on the timpani that didn't belong there, and I sort of looked over at Hillary, and I realized it was a thunderclap, and it's like, <laughs> and my baton's up in the air. That's, no, no, that was a dangerous place to be, but these folks are here playing music at an amazingly professional level, you know, with, without a huge sound system, without a perforated floor pumping cool air up on them, without dressing rooms, <laughs> without professional lighting, without sound managers. Uh, I go back and comb my own hair. I don't have a dresser. <laughs> there's no one there to hand me a whatever. You know, it's amazing as I've been here these many years, as I was privileged first to play in the orchestra when they had me back after law school and I couldn't hardly hold my violin, no less play it. And they got me going again as we've gotten so many musicians going. And all the years I've been privileged to conduct, it just amazes me the spirit and the giving that this ensemble has, not just to you, but to one another. You know, there's the pride that they have in the accomplishments. When somebody plays a solo well, people that aren't even playing are smiling because they're so proud of one another. Uh, you know, this evening we, we, we got Gip playing tuba. He's the first violin, but our tuba player Rick Lee is on duty at 911 offices, so we, we needed someone to fill in. We've got, we've got folks that are playing parts they haven't played in years. Andy Felsen's playing percussion, timpani, everything else, and he's never seen some of this music before. And I bet you he wishes he was teaching science right now. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's like all of these people come together to bring you this music. And there's something about American music in particular when when our people play it from the heart, that I, I don't know that you can do that with Beethoven without a hundred rehearsals. I don't know you can do that with Puccini's operas. I mean, it's something special about our music that makes this possible. And if all of you would join me, I just, before the end of this concert, I, I want to give them all another round of applause. <laughs> put them back to work after this, <laughs> learning all those Strauss waltzes and polkas for Oktoberfest, and then as you read in your programs, an amazing concert opening up the fall. Uh, this whole next season, we're going to be celebrating the holidays of the season, and uh, what happens around our fall concert? Halloween. So we're going to be doing Phantom of the Opera, the amazing piece of music called The Dance Macabre, where the solo first violinist intentionally tunes the violin out of tune to sound like the devil playing on a grave. And uh, just, just to spice that up a little, it's, it's a, not appropriate that she does that because we have to remember Pam's a, an Episcopal priest, but that's okay. You know. she, she can wear a different hat once or twice a year. And, and to finish the concert off, we're going to be doing the amazing unfinished symphony of Franz Schubert on the 200th anniversary of its first performance, or a few days off, close. Uh, a piece of music that we play maybe every 10 years that just, the audiences love it, and the only thing I worry about is that people think it's not finished. Actually, it wasn't played until 
15 years after his death, he finished it. It's just that everybody's waiting for him to add to it, and he's perfectly happy with it the way it was. <laughs> you know, it's just like, two movements, that's fine by me. You know, everybody else gives you three or four, well, not me, I'm different. Our holiday concerts, and you really need to come for this because we've been celebrating the holidays all these years, and we play music from Hanukkah, from Christmas, Occasionally we play Old Lang Syne to get New Year's in there, but we never celebrate that other holiday of the season, the one that begins the season, Thanksgiving. This year we're going to be doing the premiere of a new work of Thanksgiving hymns that our own Ed Howard is writing for us. It will be the first piece of music like that in the literature, and I think it's going to be really wonderful to, to do all of the holidays. So now that I've made that announcement, the next piece of music we're playing is Tribute to America, also a piece of music by Edward Howard, my assistant conductor, one of our violists. You're going to like this. I think this is one of Ed's best works, and it really is neat to have a chance to play music written by one of our own Cincinnati composers, music that's not heard anyplace else in the country. We give you Ed's Tribute to America.
it's time for a little selective uh, audience participation here. Um, there's no way we would be having this great concert tonight <coughs> were it not for the men and the women who have served us in our armed forces, who have protected our freedoms. There's no way we'd be here tonight if it wasn't for the widows and widowers of the men and women that did not come back when they went to protect our freedoms. And we want to honor our servicemen and women and honor the families of the veterans that we have lost. So we're going to do the Armed Forces salute. And as I call out your branch of service, please, please stand up and be recognized. The order that the various divisions of the military's songs appear are the Army first, then the Coast Guard, then the Marine Corps, followed by the United States Air Force, and finally the Navy. So please, when we call out your branch of the service, stand up and let us thank you for your service. If you have a son or a daughter serving now, Please stand up for them. Please stand up for those that have given the ultimate sacrifice for us.
Thank you all. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being there. Well, we're, we're sort of at the end of a concert right now. We've, uh, we've taken you a tour of American music, and we couldn't end it without West Side Story from Leonard Bernstein. I knew Maestro Bernstein very well. I didn't meet him, though, as a musician. I met him on a restoration project in New York City where we were both working on saving a great old concert hall. And he looked at me one day and he said, gee, you're not getting in the way like most architects and lawyers do. He said, you must be a trained musician. <laughs> and when I told him I had studied with Maestro Rudolph and Maestro Carlson, he said, my God, Max and Eric. I guess they were both in Cincinnati, weren't they? I said, yeah, that's where they lived. <laughs> they visited New York to play with your orchestra as they lived with us. There wasn't that I can remember in my youth or any time in my life, maybe until now with Yo-Yo Ma, there was not a musician that gave more of himself back to our nation. All of the children's concerts that, that Lenny did, the books that he wrote, the charity events. He simply couldn't be the man he was without helping the next generation and the generation after that. And now that he's gone, the generation today and tomorrow, through those wonderful films of his concerts and through the wonderful advice and teaching he gave us to pass on. He was one of the greatest people I've ever known. But his music transcends even who he was. It is the music of America. West Side Story is better known than any other piece of music ever written by an American composer. We have to remember that Bernstein was trying many years to get this opera, musical, Broadway thing off the ground. He didn't quite know what he was writing, but he was having problem getting it off the ground. The melodies were bouncing around in his head, but he just couldn't quite put it together. He originally had it as a group of African-American teenagers fighting with a group of white teenagers in downtown New York, and he met this young librettist musician named Stephen Sondheim. And Sondheim rather boldly said, Maestro, that ain't gonna fly. America's not ready for that. Let's calm it down a little so we can teach the lessons you have in your music, but not scare the public away. And so we ended up with, with a group of Hispanics and a group of Italians going at one another. We ended up with poor Tony falling in love with the girl he couldn't have and singing in Maria that he would love her until he died. And then on stage, we watch our inability to understand one another as he does just that. There's possibly not another piece of Broadway, piece of light opera, piece of even grand oratorio that teaches the lessons as clearly about loving and not hating as we learn the lessons from West Side Story. It's easy to pass it off as great music and a fun thing to watch, but it tugs right at your heartstring because it tells us we can be better Americans. That's what our music is about. This is a wonderful arrangement of West Side Story very difficult. The orchestra has worked very hard to make this happen. So we give you West Side Story, and then we're going to end with the Beach Boys.
You have been a wonderful audience. We want to thank everybody here from Springfield Township. How many of you are local from Springfield Township? You guys have no idea what a joy it is to work with your staff. They are just so helpful, so polite, so just so wonderful that it's, it's amazing. Uh, years and years ago, the first time we did a holiday concert in this space, before intermission, I noticed standing in the very back were four of your, your uh, trash collection folks in their orange uniforms. <laughs> and I went back and I said, are you guys off duty? Uh, you know, you come in for the, oh no. We're supposed to clean up after you. We're supposed to put all the chairs away and what happened. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, when it's over, I said, well, I won't tell anybody, but go eat the cookies, enjoy the music. I've trained them to put the chairs away. I don't want to have to do it myself <laughs> after the rehearsals. I've never been any place where I had a whole crew to, to clean up after me. It's just the folks here are wonderful. And you are just so privileged to have such a great staff that makes so many great things happen. Now, I have to say just two little words about the orchestra and what we do before we end. A couple people have asked, can they buy a recording of this concert? I, I want to tell you something. You can watch it on Waycross, but we can't sell you a recording. You see, if we sell recordings, we aren't a volunteer orchestra anymore. We're a professional orchestra selling our talents for money, and we lose our status as a 501c3 organization. And believe me, there are some other musical groups in this part of the country that would love to see that happen, because without donations that we can get as a nonprofit organization, we could not keep this wonderful, now almost 85-year tradition going. So, no, we can't. But you may notice in your programs, you can ask to be on the mailing list. We'd love to put you on the mailing list. And you can make a donation. And all the people that are patrons of the orchestra that make donations do get a free recording of the concert. That they will let us do. So we love to get new patrons. But, you know, as you go out, they're going to be holding some baskets. If you can just toss the change from your pocket in, or a dollar or two, that will help keep this wonderful tradition, your nation's oldest all-volunteer orchestra going. The music isn't free. We have to pay for our rehearsal space. We do pay royalties. We do pay ASCAP fees. We are like any other orchestra. We have overhead. And your help will help keep this going. Now, the last thing I'd like to say is that there's something that I found out about the Beach Boys medley, and I have done a little research on this, and it's quite true. When the Beach Boys played for the Ed Sullivan Show, we all remember the Ed Sullivan Show? <laughs> Ed Sullivan was never rehearsed. Those things that came out of his mouth as he stood there with his arms crossed looking so evil were completely ad lib. And he looked at these young, wild guys in their surfing clothes who had just played music that I doubt that he understood or could even begin to understand. And he said, when do you think up this crazy music? Well, I'll do it as he would have done it. When do you think up this crazy music? <laughs> and they answered him as one voice, completely unprompted, when the surf's up. 